Hello and a very warm welcome to the Sound of Economics Live, Bruegel's podcast and event format that uh, we are especially using in this period of tumult and crisis and, and war um, to discuss current developments and discuss the European uh, strategy. And today we are very pleased uh, to have um, uh, Dietrich Samson um, here joining us. Uh, he is the head of cabinet of the executive vice president Franz Timmermans of the European Commission and therefore in a pivotal position to really look at um, and decide how Europe um, can make itself independent or more independent from Russian fossil fuels. So we want to hear about the EU strategy uh, re Repower EU and we want to discuss that strategy critically um, together with my colleague uh, Georg Zachmann, senior fellow at Bruegel. And without much further ado, let me just mention before, before I give the word to Diedrich, uh, let me mention there is um, scope for you and our audience to, to ask questions, give, give us remarks, go on Slido um, and type in the code FUEL, FUEL, F-U-E-L, um, and I'll be able to read that here on, on my machine um, and, and uh, put those questions to, uh, to our speakers. Without much further ado, uh, Diedrich, thank you so much for joining us today um, and uh, you know, uh, bringing us up to speed on where the EU is currently in making itself independent from Russian fossil fuels. I mean, we are still using a lot of it. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Um, and indeed, uh, that conclusion is the right one and a sober one, sobering one. We are way too over dependent from uh, one supplier of fossil fuels, uh, Russia. Uh, and actually we have been sleepwalking into that situation for the last three decades. Uh, and, and that should end. Some of us knew that earlier than others, but now all of us realize it uh, due to the horrific circumstances that we are now in. Uh, and that means we have to step up to the plate and get ourselves independent from Russian fuel. Um, and that discussion actually within the commission started already earlier. Uh, actually, it started at the beginning of this mandate where we launched the Green Deal and then translated that into the climate law and translated that into Fit for 55, because that's actually our overall program to get ourselves independent from fossil fuels, full stop, including the Russian ones. Um, but obviously, this situation um, asks for a specific plan with specific, you could say, emphasis to accelerate uh, parts of Fit for 55 in order to get our dependent, our over, to end our over dependency on Russian fuels uh, as soon as we can. Um, and th those discussions started within the Commission at the beginning of last uh, autumn, actually, because we already watched before actually Putin invaded Ukraine, we already had a specific problem. We went into last winter with way too little gas storage. Uh, and we actually saved by the fact that this was one of the mildest winters in, the, in a few decades, um, uh, if you look at Europe overall. Uh, it's now I can now uh, frankly say that if we had a minus 10 winter for let's say a month in February, we would have been in, a, in, in huge trouble. Uh, and we wanted, we already before Putin started his war, we wanted to make a plan to prevent that for next winter. And that plan looks a lot like the plan that we have now on the table, which is even more urgent, which is called Repower EU. Get ourselves independent from Russian fossil fuels and more specifically get uh, rid of 66%, uh, two thirds of the fossil, of the gas imports from Russia by next winter. Um, and that's actually our, our main focus at the moment. You could say it's a, a bit narrow because it's only focusing on gas. Uh, meanwhile, we're working on coal, which is, you could say the easy part because coal you can get from all, all over the world. But also oil, which is, you could argue, just as difficult as gas. Uh, and, and so there's still a lot of work to do also by the Commission. And we take profit from the work that your think tank is doing, uh, advising, or hinting, uh, suggesting us how to, to move forward. 
Wonderful. Uh, thanks, Diederik, for the, for this first uh, kickoff. And of course, I also want to get get Georg at some stage. But before before that, can can you perhaps um, give us some more details on how we really want to go down on the on the gas, Russian gas, by by two thirds? Um, I mean, that's a huge decrease. Um, on the other hand, and you know, they, let me also give immediately the criticism of this is that this gradual reduction, uh, rel I mean, it's a rapid, but still gradual reduction compared to a full embargo stop um, is, is of course, uh, also um, uh, contributing to an increase in, in the price of gas, right? And by, by, in by, by increasing the price of gas, um, the, the, the rent that Putin and, uh, and his regime is, is gaining is, is actually increasing. So, so I, I guess I have these two questions. I mean, first, explain, explain to us how we go, go down by two thirds. Um, uh, is that two thirds for the EU as a whole? What about the more exposed countries in the East? And then the in the second step, we discuss a bit what it means in terms of actual revenues that, that Vladimir Putin still, still makes on, on sell, selling gas to us. Yeah, well, let me start with the first question. We import 150 billion cubic meters of gas. Um, I happen to notice that you calculate in terawatt hours, so you have to do everything by 10, uh, multiply it by 10, but it's the same numbers, obviously. And so 150 billion cubic meters of gas we, is imported from Russia into Europe each year. That's 150 cubic kilometers. Eh? So if you want to sort of imagine how much that is, take walk a kilometer to forward and then at one kilometer to the left and then one kilometer upwards and that's the box that is filled with gas times 150 so that's what we uh, in, in import every year so we need to get rid of 100 of that uh, by the end of next week or sorry by the beginning of next week um, and the easy part which has nothing to do with climate or diversification towards renewables or energy saving, is just getting the gas from somewhere else. Uh, and we can do that by contracting LNG from third countries like the US, like Japan, or sorry, like Australia, like uh, the Middle East, Northern Africa to a certain extent. And we think that um, if you calculate what happens in the first what happened in the first two months of this year, where we used the maximum capacity of our LNG terminals to be extended over the next years, by the way, but this is the capacity we have, we can import 50 billion cubic meters of gas extra compared to normal years. So that's already half of the hundred. That's quite a lot, uh, but that's not enough. So we also have three pipelines that are not Russian coming to Europe, which is Alg the Algerian one, the Norwegian one, and the Azerbaijani one. And uh, we can ramp the imports from those pipelines up with 10 billion cubic meters of gas. Brings us to 60. So 40 to go. And that's actually where the interesting part of the story starts, because then you are getting into Fit for 55, Green Deal, and climate policies. Diversifying not by just taking the same molecule from somewhere else, natural gas from somewhere else, but really creating more renewables, creating more efficiency, diversifying to other gases, biomethane and hydrogen. Hydrogen won't play a big role next year. I mean, up to next winter, that's pie in the sky if you want to get two billions of cubic meters of gas. Obviously, hydrogen developments are going very fast at the moment, but they start from almost zero. Uh, but another story can be told about biomethane. We have a huge potential of biogas, turning that into biomethane with the same qualities as, as natural gas that we use in our houses. We can already get to three and a half billion cubic meters by the end of next year. Um, it, that program overall doubles the ambition on biomethane compared to the original Fit for 55 plans that we had. The original plans had 17 billion cubic meters of biomethane by 2030, which is quite a lot uh, compared to what we have today. We wanted to we want to double that, and with the current gas prices, actually, biomethane has an enormous business case, so it shouldn't be too difficult. Um, energy savings is obviously one of the, the the ways to go. Could give you 14 billion cubic meters extra by next year if you. If you, if you ramp the current programs that we have already implementing or that we are implementing at the moment, if you ramp them up, not double them because that's not possible overnight, but with 20, 
20% extra, you save 14 billion cubic meters of gas. And a similar story can be told about renewables. If you calculate, if you count what, what we put down in renewables every year um, and the deployment of wind and solar last year saved us about 10 to 15 billion cubic meters of gas. If we increase that deployment over the next years, starting off with this year, obviously, we save ourselves 20 billion cubic meters of gas. So altogether, that's uh, just above 100. Um, and that's the first year. Obviously, after that first year, you can't do the trick of LNG every year again. Eh? 50 billion cubic meters is our maximum capacity. That's it. Same for the other pipelines. So you have to increase your efforts in efficiency of renewables. If you do that for three more years, we are out of Russian gas by, by 2026 or 2027. Um, that's only gas. Okay, uh, let me bring in Georg, and afterwards we talk about what it all means in terms of revenues for Putin. But but Georg, please. Yes, thanks a lot. Um, let me try to, to to be very German and directly jump into uh, uh, into the points that um, that I find sticky. Um, I think the um, kind of the current plan is supposed to be a kind of gradual phase out, a very sp a speedy gradual, uh, but gradual phase out. And as I see it, the situation we are confronted with is a situation where every day we are threatened with a supply disruption from Russia or from uh, our own political system in order to, uh, to, uh, to do something in what is really an economic war. And we are now in an economic wartime. It is not a business as usual situation. It is kind of an emergency situation that requires to go beyond the uh, uh, kind of the usual approaches of, uh, of a gradual uh, roll out of more of the good stuff that we that we anyway planned, and the uh, the scenario as I can see it does not focus really on the on the imminent crisis as much as it focuses essentially on kind of slowly uh, or not slowly fast uh, declining the um, um, the amount of uh, guys. But the problem is the imminent crisis is super dangerous uh, because essentially if we do not manage to coordinate the imminent crisis well important European institutions will fall apart. If we do not manage to, to, to find a way to have really a coordination for this uh, for this imminent crisis, and it needs preparation. So we really need to start now to, to prepare for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the crisis in 2021, 2022, and not for the potential uh, risks in 2024, 2025. We have the risk on the single market, and it's already starting uh, with uh, Spain and Portugal partly decoupling from the European market. We have the risk on the integrity of the ETS, and ultimately we have the risk on the solidarity between member states in, in energy terms. And therefore, I, I fear that we still have too much focus on the, uh, on the midterm. And uh, um, the question here is also, do we really want to cut Russia forever? I mean, it's kind of what, what's the point of having sitting next to a, uh, uh, to an, uh, to a neighbor that uh, our plan is about entirely cutting off from it? I mean, that, that sounds uh, very, very difficult also to, to pursue if they are offering us next year, the year after, and, and all the following years, always guess at a quarter of the price uh, that we can get elsewhere, it will be very difficult to withstand the temptation. So we should better build institutions that allow us to, to buy in a, uh, in a safe and secure way uh, of what is, what is good for us, not only let a certain European companies benefit from it, but let European citizens benefit from, uh, from this. Now on, the potent, uh, on, on, a, on a few smaller items, um, on the incentives for uh, for filling gas storages, um, yeah, I'm I'm not entirely sure, but uh, what we what we have in place is actually going to work. It's still risking that member states are doing their own stuff, and uh, I mean we need to bring gas into the east now. We need to bring gas into Polish and Hungarian storages, and maybe in, in Ukrainian storages, because we will not be able to supply Eastern Europe if gas is being cut, and we uh, only start sending them gas in uh, after summer. Uh, the flow that we calculated that is needed there is a constant annual flow. If you cut it down, it's getting to be quite uh, quite complicated. We still have 
European member states, governments going to uh, to uh, to all those difficult uh, uh, supplier countries and competing. And I don't know what they are offering in the uh, in backdoor meetings to them, in terms of uh, political or military assistance or things. But also in terms of economics, we are seeing that they are there's going to be an overbidding war. And um, the uh, the current approach to to say we make we make a voluntary uh, coordination of our buying efforts might not be able to ensure solidarity if it really comes to the uh, comes to the so we should move faster on that. Okay, on, Georg, Georg, let let Dietrich uh, perhaps okay. reply to some of those points. These were already very meaty points. So, so Dietrich, please. Well, I think the main point is, and uh, George is completely right. Um, if you, the only way to to really address this crisis uh, that is indeed also imminent in terms of prices and indeed possible disruption. Uh, both items are, are translated into the current volatility of the gas market. The only way to address that is as uh, Europe as a whole, uh, Europe as one. Um, all the other attempts are just trying to tackle some symptoms, uh, decoupling electricity prices from gas prices, as the Iberian uh, Peninsula now wants, is actually asking um, companies to turn very expensive gas into very cheap electricity. Uh, there's nobody having a magic stick here. Uh, capping gas prices um, only works if you can get that gas at the at the price cap. Otherwise, you spend billions or tens or even hundreds of billions of euros of taxpayers' money. So what we should do, and that's also what the Commission proposed to the Council, is joint purchasing of gas. So indeed, no longer going out there in the world uh, as a country or as a company, out on your own, overbidding the other, trying to secure the last bill, the last cubic meter of gas from Qatar or wherever, because that will lead to increased prices. What we, uh, and the only way to secure a moderate price is, well, basically you need two, two ingredients. You need to be a big buyer and you need to be in it for the long term. And Europe can do both. Uh, if we combine our demand, we are the biggest gas buyer in the world. And if we convince the partner countries, be it Qatar or be it the US, that we are in this for the long game, so not just for the next five years buying as much LNG as possible, but entering into a long-term partnership towards hydrogen development, which is especially relevant for Qatar, US, but especially for Northern Africa, we could enter into partnerships with third countries that are healthy long-term, and deliver energy at moderate prices. Not the prices that we've seen 10 years ago, or five years ago, or even two years ago, because let's face it, those prices were too cheap. Can I push you a little bit on this solidarity argument and the joint purchases? I mean, I, of course, being, being in Brussels and being a, a good European, I'm totally buying into that story. Uh, but I'm only buying into that story if at the same time uh, you can guarantee me um, that there will be the internal solidarity in terms of gas supply. So, so, so put differently, what Georg mentioned, I mean, can we really be sure that the gas will be sent to Germany and to the East um, um, if, if the next winter comes and there are some shortages and, you know, we have to distribute and decide uh, how, to, how to allocate this, this scarcity uh, of, of gas? So, so I mean, yes, yes we, can. we can critique uh, Robert Habeck uh, uh, for for being in Qatar and you know striking striking a deal, but you know, can he actually be sure that he would get um, Dutch gas, uh, for example? Since you're Dutch, let me ask you directly: uh, in case in case um, he needs it more than than the Dutch need it, I mean, so, so where do we stand on this internal solidarity argument? Uh, we already started that discussion more than 13 years ago. It lost, uh, this is not the first gas crisis that we have. 2009, we had a similar story, a similar situation. And in that situation, Europe already embarked onto uh, regulations and, um, and arrangements for solidarity. We can strengthen those. I'm not even sure whether that's actually needed because they are already in place. What is needed is obviously the perspective that there is at least some um, uh, that there is at least enough gas for everyone, uh, maybe with some demand curtailment, but not in crisis mode. Uh, I lost your picture, by the way. Are we still ill? 
uh, I'm I'm here. I can see you also. Yes. <laughs> well, then we do without pictures. No problem for me. No. So I I think the the best way uh, forward is to you're right. If if these internal solidarity mechanisms need to be increased, they need to be increased, and they will have to be increased. But internal solidarity to di to distribute or to to share uh, an enormous shortage is going to be much more difficult than internal solidarity to share a sort of an, a, a supply that is meeting some of the demands. Maybe not all. I mean, mm. I'm the first to, to go out there and tell the European population that we might prepare for being able to use less gas than we, than we are comfortable with. Yes, that's the new so situation. Reduce, reduce the heating. Yes, well, that's one of the ideas that we put into Repower EU, and maybe it's a bit, it was a bit uh, tongue in cheek, but it was there as a serious proposal. If everybody puts the heat down with one degree, we save ourselves 10 billion cubic meters of gas in, in Europe. No, no, but I, I think that's that's definitely what we have to do, um, uh, just to also increase our strategic options vis-a-vis uh, -vis Putin and, and you know save some gas and fill up the storages more quickly. But but Georg, I want to bring in uh, bring you back in, into the discussion because you also have to leave at at 11:30 sharp. So, so Georg, please add add a few po few more points. Yeah, no, I, um, I think this this point of Solidarity is essential, the essential point. And um, one idea that uh, I, I would like to test with you essentially is to which degree uh, essentially the US could help us with this uh, solidarity aspect. So I see that um, we have a kind of a pool of options that we have available in the different member states and that are not only market options, but some of them are non-market options. So in your country, we can ask population to accept uh, seismic activity in the, in the groaning field. In my country, uh, Germany, we can accept, uh, ask a population to accept the prolongation of nuclear plants, kind of accepting that certain uh, coal-fired power plants are brought back from the reserve, that lignite-fired power plants produce uh, fully, that maybe some pollution limits are not applicable anymore to uh, in order to be able to burn dirt Dirtier coal um, to to ask to the French to build gas pi uh, a gas or an electricity uh, crossing from uh, from Spain. So there is a lot of things that that governments and political systems we would ask them for. Then there would be a lot in terms of gas uh, joint procurement and where we kind of buy the gas and have to distribute it. So there are so many levels of distributional effects in that. And I wonder whether a sort of a joint approach with the US as a sort of honest broker that can bring in a lot of energy into the European system, but only does it if we manage to, to get our uh, uh, get our act together, could essentially help us to strike an internal political deal. Because then those that are not uh, getting part of this, uh, of this European uh, activity might then not benefit from the uh, from the US energy riches that uh, that they might bring over uh, so any any sort on, on that would be uh, would be appreciated you want me to um, to respond to that uh, yeah you can come uh, yes yes please yes please <laughs> all right um, yes, well, the U.S. is obviously a very important partner, and and uh, you could call them an honest broker. Although they all they also tell us that yes, they are prepared to deliver uh, 15 billion cubic meters of LNG already this year, running up to 30 uh, at the end uh, in in a few years' time. But there is a cost uh, to it, a price. So I wouldn't put all my eggs in in only the U.S. basket. Um, we are looking at also from a Green Deal perspective, also from a forward looking perspective, we are looking at North Africa with more interest uh, than average yeah, because we think that North, uh, Northern Africa can both supply gas on the short term, Egypt, Algeria, but also can supply us with the hydrogen we need in the mid to long term. I mean, if we walk from crisis to crisis from year to year, we will never solve this. We also need a long term vision on where we want it go in the end. Um, and uh, George, you said uh, it is actually strange to think of Russia uh, or of cutting off Russia forever for completely. But in terms of natural gas, that's actually what we are going to do. And not only with Russia, actually, it's what we're going to do with everything, 
everyone in the world because we are getting out of fossil fuels, not just from Russia, but from everybody. Um, but and we have to think Friedrich, about that. Sorry, on this point, on this point, I mean, can, can you give us a sense of the timeline? I mean, there's one thing to say, uh, we want to get out of fossil fuel in 10 years, et cetera, et cetera, um, as the Green Deal was 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 saying, uh, there's quite another one saying we get out of it in, in the next two, three years. And, you know, coming back to Georg's point, uh, suppose there was a change in, um, in uh, let's say, the political orientation of Russia, let's put it this way, in, pol in polite terms, terms, I mean, will you really be uh, will you really be able to uh, to do next year and say next year? Well, we are not gonna let's say next year we have a different political regime in Russia. We're not going to use the cheap Russian gas and instead rely on uh, whatever kind of constructions, expensive LNGs. I mean, given also that the indus industrial orientation, of course, of of many of our countries is very much, and including the German one, of course, is very much still oriented on on cheap gas to produce uh, all no, no. industrial outputs. I, I, so. I fully agree, um, uh, although it's hard to speculate about easing the relationship with Russia at the moment, but let's let's add for for the, uh, say, uh, the sake of argument, um, try and do that for a moment. Yes, at a certain, as I said, our plan, Repower EU, is not only Green Deal oriented, it's not only uh, decarbonizing our energy uh, supply, it's also about diversifying our gas supplies. Diversifying means having the flexibility to go in any direction. So back to Russia, if that is possible in the in the coming years, uh, would be an option for the natural gas that we need. But meanwhile, at least one third, and at the end of this decade, more than two thirds of our gas plan is about decarbonization. It's about not needing natural gas anymore whether it's from Russia or somewhere else. So indeed, what we what we did, and actually it's not it's it's not rocket science, what we did is we put fit for 55 on the table and looked at how much gas supply it replaces by decarbonizing our economy. And then we said, okay, let's shift that as much as we can forward and away from Russia right. because of the current circumstances. But we didn't change the internal objectives or the intrinsic objectives of our plan, which is to decarbonize our economy and make ourselves independent from fossil fuels, per se. Okay, um, I, uh, I know Georg, Georg has, to, has to leave. Georg, did you say, want to say one last word? Or? Yeah, if, uh, if I may, I'm, I mean, I'm very happy that the, that the Commission kind of didn't throw out the decarbonization agenda in uh, in the face of this crisis and essentially tries to use it as a catalyst to to move faster on that. And I'm sure that this is the right way to uh, to go, um, because I mean, now the crisis might also enable us to do things uh, and bring them forward that we otherwise would not have been able to do. And I would actually call upon uh, both national and European system to to make use of this crisis to to do things like building transmission lines that have not been possible or uh, or uh, uh, wind uh, wind farms things that we kind of really need uh, more uh, urgently now than uh, than ever and where the um, the political system was so sticky in the past that uh, things became un uh, impossible to a degree that was not healthy in, in my view anymore but uh, that is that is one uh, one element the, the another point that I would like to to make at the end and it's, uh, Another call for action, sort of for trying to be so um, a bit polemic, but the um, uh, there is a my, my feeling is that there's a, still a bit of a um, lack of sense of priority and urgency on the topic. I mean, it's a topic that we have been discussing now in energy circles and also on a high level of government for 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 two months or so. Uh, but still, there is no 24-7 emergency group that is dealing with that. There is not really a pooling of of the uh, of the of the experts. The discussions that I'm participating in are happening in, in 20 different circles. And uh, it is very uh, 
is very unclear on uh, on how and where to inject knowledge. And there's so much expertise out there in the system. And there is so many technical challenges and difficulties in this thing. And we are, in my view, in an economic war. And it needs some sort of um, yeah economic situation room, a war room here to be able to say, OK, what do we need? We need this amount of LNG. That's this group that is going to, to, to look into that and talk with the industry to do that. There's another group that is looking into how can we get more more electricity being produced without natural gas and all those things i mean we, we can do that and it does not necessarily mean market intervention uh, at the at the at the initial stage it just okay. means bringing the data together and i mean today i still don't know how much uh, uh, oil is flowing through the drushba pipeline and the uh, the gas import tracker that we built at the time was the uh, was one of the few tools that were mm -hmm. available to to see things happening and I think the the strength of Europe is that we have this uh, this this huge amount of expertise, very uh, in a very distributed way and functioning through market. But maybe in this crisis situation, it would be very helpful to set up a sort of grouping that uh, that brings this expertise better thank, together. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Georg, for a call for a crisis group, and I'm I'm sure Diederik, um, you you see that. Um, as a as a welcome suggestion, and perhaps you can invite one of our experts into in, into this group. <laughs> I'm sure that would be very useful. Well, uh, we um, we consider we consider ourselves uh, sort of the crisis group. At least I mean we are making that plan that George is is um, is work um, mentioned uh, to be published in May. And we've the Repower EU was a that we did in March was the proposal, and now we are asked by council by member states to turn that into a plan. Turning a proposal into a plan means uh, putting real concrete maps on the table with, for instance, the interconnectors that we need to build in order to make this happen. Um, that we look at every member state's plans for renewable energy. May, um, many of them are part of the so-called recovery plans that all the member states have made in the context of next generation EU. And we're going to look at those plans and see where we can accelerate and increase the ambition of those plans. So really putting the bits and pieces together, including also the indeed working on the LNG imports. Um, and not to forget, we, we need to work on our industry because we can import uh, hydrogen uh, as if there's no tomorrow. We can ramp up our renewable electricity production. We need to make our industry ready to use all that hydrogen and electricity. That requires real transformation of steel, chemical, fertilizer industry, the big fossil fuel consumers uh, of today right. need to be the demandeurs for renewable electricity and hydrogen of tomorrow. Those three legs of the plan, LNG imports, ramping up our renewables, making our industry ready to receive all that new, all those renewables, those three legs are going to be developed uh, in the next seven weeks to be published somewhere at the end of May. Okay, uh, we uh, uh, we um, started a little bit late and so I hope we can also run over a little bit because there are actually a huge amount of questions, uh, huge interest, lots of people following us. And so so if you allow Diedrich, I will just uh, ask you a few questions and perhaps you can just take take note and 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 uh, you know respond in in one go um, to uh, to the, to a set of questions. and and per perhaps one I mean one point by, um, Agata uh, Loscott Strachota is, you know, um, you member states which will phase out Russian oil gas quicker risk decreasing their competitive situation versus those who are more reluctant to do so. Any idea how to deal with, with that? Um, then we have a question. So that's one question on the relative competitiveness. Then we have one question by Nicola Gaetan. Um, uh, thoughts on uh, how to increase interconnection between the Iberian Peninsula and the EU uh, to use Spain's uh, huge regasification uh, capacities. And uh, similarly, uh, on the same venue, uh, Gazzani from Bank of Italy is asking on LNG, the European regasification spare capacity is about 37 uh, billion cubic meter with meters without Spain. So your estimate of 50 relies it on an increased regasification capacity still, still in, in 22. Um, and um, and uh, per perhaps those ta we take those two for a first round. Um, all right. Uh, well, actually three, but 
No, the, it's um, connected the second. <laughs> three. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, on the relative competitiveness, that requires indeed uh, a burden sharing uh, agreement, as I, as we discussed also with George in the in the, in the still in the call on um, having um, expanding the 2009 framework uh, on solidarity uh, of gas supplies uh, to each other. Um, I don't think, by the way, that the premise that a country that moves out of fossil fuels faster um, has a competitive disadvantage. I do think that the countries that did move out of fossil fuels faster have a competitive advantage at the moment. And that situation might not change in the next 10 years. Um, and that's exactly what, what needs to happen um, in the context of the Green Deal and Fit for 55. On the interconnection capacity, well, as I said, um, we are going to put a, a map on the table uh, in May saying, hey, Europe, member states, if we really want to make this happen and we are serious, we have to uh, we have to make them some interconnections that were taboo uh, up to now. And that's going to be uh, discussions uh, with some um, quite some tense, uh, there might be some quite some tense discussions, but we need to have them. We can't... But, but why only in May? Why only in May? I mean, this, uh, if we need the capacity for the next winter, I mean, we have to do it now. Um, no, and, no, no. Uh, we the, know, for, no, no, no. The interconnectors, uh, uh, even if I would put, put them on the table right now, uh, the, the interconnector won't be there uh, for next winter. Uh, so uh, this is this is for the this is for the multi-year approach. Um, right. and, and we... It's, it's not like that everything that we are too late for for next winter is, uh, well, we should forget about it. No, because there's winters after next winter. Um, so that's that's for the interconnectors. But um, brings me to the other question on the regasification, the 37 billion cubic meters of, of spare capacity. Um, our calculations tell us that if we ex if, if we extrapolate what we did in January and February last year, or di of this year, so actually the last two months, uh, we get ourselves to a 50 billion cubic meters extra LNG capacity, um, including the Spanish ones. I mean, they they are going to be used for Spain uh, and for uh, for Portugal. Uh, they also need uh, extra gas, um, but the um, uh, and for the rest of Europe, we can we can touch upon that that 50 billion cubic meters. It's not going to be easy. And for the years after, we would be better off if we have more regasification capacity, more LNG terminals, and they are be being built at the moment. Also, those those are for, let's say, the years after next year, not for next winter. So, so perhaps one last set of, of questions. I mean, we have a question here um, um, on, um, you know, basically emphasizing that the solutions you put forward are, are good on the medium to long term, but we have to fill the storages in the next four to five months and it will, will cost a lot. Uh, what, what, what can EU countries concretely do and what should they do um, so that we, um, we solve that problem? And um, uh, connect, connected to this, um, there is a question um, by, by someone from, um, I think, the chemical industry. And he's saying, well, prices, prices for gas will stay at a very high level. Even if we get enough gas, the prices will be very high, causing much harm. What do we do about this? Um, what do we do about the, um, the, the industry sectors that are really dependent on, on cheap, cheap gas? Um, and um, and perhaps I, I abuse and ask you push you a little bit more on, you know, um, the question I asked initially, in which we didn't have time to discuss uh, yet, which is uh, about the revenues. I mean, so 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 Putin does make a lot of revenues currently um, out of gas and and oil sales. Um, the full embargo is is rejected, but. Um, isn't isn't there a need to come at least with a solution where we actually tax away the profits or uh, set up a, a price cap um, so that the the rent that Putin receives on, on current current sales um, actually goes down? Perhaps you can also comment on that on that point. Yeah, 
it, it touches upon a pretty fundamental issue uh, that also George uh, raised several times in his interview. He says we are in an economic war. Um, the truth is we are not because we don't dare to be. Uh, that's that's the, the conclusion after a few European councils and, uh, and NATO summits and G7 summits. Europe doesn't want to cut itself off Russian fossil fuels completely because it doesn't want to enter into an economic war. Um, given that circumstance, given though that, that premise, we are working on getting ourselves as independent as possible, as quick, uh, as, as, quick as possible. Uh, but we're not in an economic war because we don't want to be, apparently. And that's, mm, I, 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 I'm not saying I, I agree with that fact, but it's a fact. Um, on prices, uh, I mean, on revenues for Putin, uh, yes, he, he, he earns a half a billion a, a day uh, on our fossil fuel imports. And that's exactly why we should end them as soon as possible. Um, I don't think a cap on on the prices that we pay uh, Russia will help a lot. Uh, at least I would love to try, but apparently Europe doesn't want to try because obviously it will risk a uh, supply disruption overnight. If we call Moscow and say we, we're not going to pay more than 35 euros per megawatt hour, I don't think we will get any gas anymore. And uh, it would be a very effective way of starting that economic war. Um, on the, the, the question of on energy prices, actually, there is something strange happening at the moment. When we were in an energy crisis in the 70s, countries responded with actually the only sensible response that you can deliver in such a situation, which is rationing. Ration the use of fossil fuels because you have an energy crisis. So we saw the car-free car Sundays and, and the likes. At the moment, Many, if not all countries worldwide, but especially Europe, are responding by subsidizing energy. So in response to an energy crisis, we're reducing VAT, we're reducing excise duties, we're subsidizing the use of energy, which everybody will explain to you is the wrong response. Exactly. Let's face it, it's, it's the wrong way around. Um, and apparently we are rich enough, wealthy enough uh, to do this. Um, I'm not sure whether it's the best possible solution. I would like to get rid of, get out of this situation as soon as we can, hence Fit for 55, hence Repower EU, to get ourselves out of this over-dependency, out of this, this dilemma, because at the moment we have to draw a conclusion that countries are not able to respond in the best possible way. Um, they they are um, trying to to keep the price down while the price is going up. Every economist can explain to you that the only uh, answer to this energy crisis should be getting our demand down as soon as we can. And and part of that is a story that nobody dares to tell out loud, uh, dares to say out loud. So let me be the one that does it. Yes, energy will be much more expensive as of now. Yes, energy was way too cheap in the last 40 years. And we've profited from it. We have created an enormous wealth at the expense of planet Earth. And so we do realize right now at the expense of geopolitical imbalances. And both need to be repaired. And in order to repair them, we need to pay more for energy. And by the way, also for food. The two basic needs of life, food and energy, we have paid way too little for that in the last 40 years, and we need to restore that situation. Can't be done overnight because you create too much uh, havoc and trouble in a society, so you need to take your time, but given the current situation, we have little time to do that. Diederik, thank you so much. These were some very, very important and clear messages at the end. And I think I, I completely uh, agree with your point that we need to really uh, change our demand pattern rapidly, uh, subsidizing and reducing the cost of energy in a situation of supply shortages is, is crazy. 
um, on the contrary, we need to we need to restrain our demand, and we need to ac- understand that energy and also, as you say, food is going to cost 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 more, and that will change our societies. It will change our economic model. It will change also our economic structure, our export structure. We might export less. Um, industrial energy intensive goods to the rest of the world than we do currently so there are pretty fundamental changes that are happening and um, I think what what I can say now only our time is over Um, you've been extremely clear um, extremely generous with your time I enjoyed the discussion a lot and uh, thank you so much for you being so clear and upfront, uh, and especially at the end with some very clear messages. And thank you to our audience for, for listening and for asking so many questions. I could not ask all of them, but I think we got we got really a good sense where the thinking in the commission currently is on this issue. So thank you, Diederik. Uh, thank you to all of you for listening. Bye-bye. Thank you.